Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm Avi Astian. I'm the undergraduate assistant. This is the data science workshop series offered through um, the data science department of the library. We're very grateful to have you all here today and we're glad to get to get to dip our toes into Python. Um, and yeah, I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. Okay. Uh, I'm Sarah Mannheimer. I'm the data librarian in the library. I'll be maybe teaching a bit at the end. <laughs> I'm Greta Lindsay, and I'm the facility manager for social data collection and analysis services. Um, we just call it ourselves social data. Um, after graduate school, I did a lot of coding in Python, and then I went into R, and I'm um, refreshing my memory in Python. And so some of the, the a lot has changed from when I first started using Python. Um, and so sometimes I have to still have to look things up to remember them, but the new way of Python. Um, and I'm Sally Slyper. Um, I'm a research statistician for social data with Greta. Um, and I'm learning Python. I use R heavily and they're similar. So I've been learning the nuances between the two. So yeah. Yeah. So that's our team. Um, um do you have any, I've never had a bit of a technical difficulty with this green sharing. I'm seeing it looks like white yeah it's that mm. looks like i'm sharing the wrong thing let me uh change oh, that yeah. i meant to share the whole screen and i'm oh on the far left thank you yes. and i shared the wrong thing okay perfect. okay that is that is better and i'm gonna move this down here and hopefully that stays out of the way perfect and I just wanted to check in with you guys. Um, does everyone get a chance to download plot nine or would you guys like to be walked through that? Okay, perfect. So then I think we're just going to go straight. Do, are you guys in Jupyter notebook right now? Perfect. Awesome. Um, and you have everything pulled up. No problems. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, so welcome to Jupyter notebook. This is one of the many, um. Different like ways you can work with Python. It allows you to kind of work interchangeably with text and code and really make it like a notebook, basically very like in the name. Um, so the files we use with this are called IPython notebook files and yeah, allows you to work in reproducible fashion with what are called code chunks. And then there's going to be 3 different kind of code chunks. Markdown is just this text right here. Then there's a raw. This is for displaying possible code, but it's not actually executable. And then this is what actual executable code looks like. And you're just going to run that by hitting shift enter or any of those other commands just up here. Perfect. Yeah. And then this just talks a little bit about saving that. We'll get to that later at the end of the workshop. Um, hopefully you'll have something nice and usable to look back on by the end of this workshop. So we want to be able to save that for you guys. Perfect. And then one of the most basic things you can do with Python is use it as a calculator. It's really easy just to put in anything and just run it. And you can do this with various different simple arithmetic equations, or you can download packages um, and do things a little more complicated, but we'll get into that later. Something to note about Python is that the caret is not used as the exponent symbol. It's just two double stars. Um, so Python will not register that. So be really careful about that. And then something nice, nice about Python as well is that it is not space sensitive. So you can kind of space your equations out to make it a little more easy for viewing, not as much of a headache. And then this kind of just walks you through if you wanted to run all of these equations without having to type them out or like get all the answers for those equations without having to type them out you would use the module interactive shell and we'll get into that a bit later but that's kind of how you do that yes oh yes so yeah it'll pop out all the answers and then like R, Python has a lot of different um, libraries and packages that it has to offer. These are called 
IDE, or these are not called IDEs. These are um, often referred to as modules. You use these, you import them by using the import. Sorry, I'm getting a little nervous up here. I'm new to teaching, sorry. <laughs> um, you import these by just typing import. You can import the entire module, um, so you can use all of it, or you can type a period and then just extract part of this. So this looks something like module attribute or math square root two. Um, so you're not actually importing the whole module, so it makes it a little bit easier. To work with. And so, yeah, that's the very, very interest of Python. Okay. So, um, I'll be teaching the next section, which is about doing a little bit more with the code, um, working with objects and different data types. So, we've kind of just done calculations and um, pulling in some different math functions. Um, so, something you're going to probably do a lot in Python or in your analysis um, is creating objects. So, that's just um, where you name something. Here, for example, we're calling something X. And you're assigning that a value. So here we're assigning um, x the value of six, and we're doing that with the equal sign. Um, so we can run that, and then you'll notice I ran that, so it was assigned, but it doesn't tell us, like it doesn't give us any feedback about anything after that. So if we want to check what value x ha uh, has, we can type in the object we're interested in and run that, and it'll tell tell us the value. Um, and something we'll come back to is working in a Jupyter notebook. We just have to type the name of the object like that. Uh, but if you're using something like command line, you'll have to use the function print to actually get that to print out. So um, that'll come up further on. Um, so X is an object and some uh, important aspects of that is um, objects and Python in general is case sensitive. Um, so, um, if we wanted to type in something uppercase X and we tried to run that, we get an error because we only assigned a value to lowercase X. Um, so just be careful of that. Um, and a good rule for working with objects is making sure that they have descriptive names. So X is probably not that great. Um, you could use something like, um, you know, if you're working with temperature data, naming it current temperature, um, or that gets to be long, so you can um, shorten that to maybe current temp. Um, so something descriptive, but still easy to work with. Um, you can't start object names with a number, so you couldn't have like a two in front of this. Um, you can put numbers throughout the name and at the end, but you know, just be careful, like calling something clean data two, what does that really mean? It might not be descriptive enough. Um, and you can use underscores in um, the object names, but no other punctuation. Um, and then lastly, uh, commonly don't wanna use um, function names or anything like that for your object names, just to avoid confusion. Um, or potentially even overwriting functions, and then um, you think you're using a function and it's really an object you made. And so um, avoid things like, you know, calling it a mean or standard deviation because there's functions that have the same name. Um, and then uh, if you use kind of uh, a consistent coding style, that helps make everything really clear. And an important note about clean code is making things organized, easy to read, well named. Um, and that makes it so you have really good reproducible research so other people can read it and understand what's going on. You can come back to it in three years, understand what you did. Um, and there's a couple different style guides listed in here, um, which are great because they um, make things really consistent. Um, and those are interesting. It just gives you stuff like uh, what types of spacing should you use or what's the best way to use comments, stuff like that. So you can take a look there for some tips. Um, okay, back to objects. Um, we can do things with objects. So, uh, once again, we have X equals six here. Um, and run that. 
Um, and then, oh, this is like going back to, um, it doesn't give you output if you just assign a value, you need to tell it to print the output if you wanna check what the value is. And so here we have that print function that, um, when in doubt, use the print function, because uh, that works on command line, where just listing the name, just putting W only works in kind of environments like this, like a Jupyter notebook. Um, so we've got W here, um, and that has a value of nine now. And once we have those created, we can use them in operations. Um, like here, we can do some calculations. So run that, and we can see X, uh, we assigned a six. So 2.2 times six gives us 13.2. Um, four plus six gives us 10. So now we can just substitute that object instead of that number. Um, we can also overwrite that value if we wanna change it. So if we run this code chunk, we have y equals x plus six. Um, and then after that, we assign the value um, x was six. Now we're giving it a new value of two. Um, so after running that, does anybody have a guess what y equals right now? 12, Let's see, yes, it is 12. Um, so what happens with reassigning that value? That happened after we calculated Y. So now we assigned a new value. And if we run this again, it'll use the new value of X and we run that again and now Y equals eight. So the order in which you perform the operations matters. <laughs> um, and that's why it kind of fills in these numbers on the side. If you've noticed, um, it tells you what order you're um, running chunks in. Um, cause if you hop around, you might do something unexpected. Um, okay. So we have more complicated, uh, data types. Those are just values. Um, but we can also make vectors, which in Python are usually lists or a NumPy array. Um, and these are just a series of entries, um, that you string together, uh, as a vector, um. Here we have a code chunk. This is to install NumPy, and this is a package that deals with the NumPy arrays, a type of vector. Um, so this, you can install this, or you can go back to Anaconda, like described earlier in the instructions to install NumPy. Um, I think it might be in there by default. Um, so um, we want to pull up NumPy. We're gonna import that, and we're gonna give it the alias NP, uh, just to shorten that. Um, and then, uh, we're going to create a vector using, um, you can use brackets, um, with values separated by commas to create a vector, or you can use, um, NP dot array. So using the NumPy package and its array function to do the same thing. Um, and then for both of those, we're going to print out the answer either by listing the object name or using the print function. And we run that and we can see the printed out uh, list that we made. Um, so you can see that they give you basically the same thing. They're slightly different, um, but uh, we'll go into some of those differences later. But here are our vectors or our um, string of entries. Um, so these are numerical values. You can also do it with characters, character strings. Um, so here we have, um, you need quotes around your text to create a character string. If you don't have quotes, it'll think it's looking for an object. Um, so we've got our quotes around different character strings and we can make vectors of those. And the same thing. So here are our character vectors. Um, and then going back to the differences on that, um, we can use this type function to look up what type of an object we have. So you use type and then you put your object in there. And for the first one, we can see it's uh, more technically a list. And the second one is more technically a NumPy ND array. Um, so the NumPy array is n dimensional um, array um, and it stores values of only the same uh, type. So only numbers, all only numbers or all only characters. Um, a list is a little more flexible. It kind of does the same thing. Um, but you can have um, different data types within that. So you could have a mixture of numbers, strings, even other objects. Um, 
so it's a little bit more flexible. Um, and I guess here's your first chance to exercise to do the this exercise one. Um, so try making your own uh, vector called uh, DES DEC and have decimal values in there. Um, and so you can either use just the square brackets to make a list or you can use the NP array and try running that and see what you get. Um, so. so it looks like I ran this and it's saying that math is not defined. So I don't think I loaded the math package. It's greater up somewhere. Import math. So that's what happens if you didn't pull up the right package. So I'll run this. Um, and that's where things like square root are stored or the value of pi. Okay, so now we have math.pi. There we go. And then using type, we can see that this code here, we created a numpy array. Um, and those are all decimals. So this is what that looks like. Um, uh, okay, so that's vectors. We have a few different options for vectors. Um, we can also use dictionaries. Um, so in Python, a dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. Um, they're similar. You use instead of square brackets, you use the curly braces to create that. And you can list out values you want to store in an object there. Um, and instead of commas to separate values, we give it a name. Um, like here, we're starting off with a key of hello, and then using a colon to give it hello, the value of hola. Um, so in, in this case, this is these are both um, storing the key as uh, a, a named value, and then the value is also a value. So th this example is like very literally a dictionary, <laughs> uh, but you can assign different values to these keys too. Um, so on that, so what this is showing us is we created this dictionary called translate and we're storing values for hello, how are you, um, strawberry. Um, and then here we're taking that object and using square brackets and pulling out, um, we wanna look up what is the value associated with the key strawberry. So we run that and it gives us the associated value, which is Frisa. Sorry, my Spanish is very bad. <laughs> um, so that's how we can use dictionaries. Um, and then relating this back to vectors, I don't know how they're similar or different. Um, let's see, going back to vectors are ordered. So things are indexed in a vector by what order they're in. Not like it doesn't put things alphanumerically. That's not what order it is. It's just um, when you add things onto a vector, they're always in the same order that you give it. And that's how you pull things out is by its position in the vector. Um, and vectors are indexed by integer positions and dictionaries are unordered and they're indexed by the keys. So whatever name you're giving all of the different keys in there. Um, in vectors, elements can be all of the same type uh, for a NumPy array, they can be different types if they're um, the, just the square bracket list. Um, dictionaries can also be all different data types. Um, and then you can also change the values in vectors and dictionaries. Um, so um, uh, you can replace a value in a vector with a different value. You can replace a value in a dictionary, uh, but in dictionaries, you cannot change the keys that you set up. So there will always be um, hello, how are you, strawberry, and you can't change those. Um, is there a equivalent to a dictionary in R? There is. Uh, so I think it's listed in here. Um, a dictionary in R is like a list. R list is like a Python dictionary. And what was the other one? And um, Python list is like an R vector. Just so, <laughs> yeah, the terminology can get confusing. <laughs> um, or I think a dictionary is sort of like a named list yeah. um, in R. 
But it's it's mutable. It can change the name. True. Okay. And R. Python is <laughs> pickier and safer in some ways. It doesn't. It's set up so that hopefully you make fewer whoopsies, but mm. you can still get yourself into big trouble in Python too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, in Python, there's more things that once you set it, it can't be changed, which prevents us from making human mistakes. <laughs> um, so uh, in this next code chunk, there's a lot here, but basically we're just going to go through how you can change or not change values in these different data types. Um, so I'll run all of this. So first we're creating a vector and this is a list. So it's got all one, two, three, four. Um, and then we can print out the first, the first element in this list. So we do that with um, calling the object name square brackets, and then this zero, um, Python starts counting at zero instead of one. So zero means the first element. So it's pulling out the first element in this uh, list, which is one. We can see our output here. It gave us one. Um, and now we can modify that by taking that um, vector bracket zero. So we're saying we want to assign a value to the first element in that vec object and equals five. And then we're going to print that out. Um, and so we've now changed this one to a five and that's printing out this five here. Um, the whole thing. It will show you five. Yes, and I can show you that. We don't have it on here. It's just printing out the first element, but you can um, do print. Spell it right. Okay. Um, so this is after changing that value. Rerun that. And so now here's our new VEC object. So five instead of one. So good question. Um, okay. So you can change uh, vector list um, entries. Uh, so now we're gonna try changing dictionaries. So we're gonna create that same dictionary called translate as above. Um, and here we're just pulling out to take a look, um, uh, translate object and we're pulling out what is the value for assigned to the key. The key is how are you? So we wanna know what value goes with that. Um, and that gives us como estas. Um, so now we can add a new key value pair. So adding on to the dictionary. So translate, and we want to add this new key called I like cheese and assign it the value of me gusta el queso. And then we print that out and we get me gusta el queso. So that's good. Good check that we've uh, created that new key value pair. And now we're going to go back to um, hello is already a key in the dictionary um, that we created. And so we're going to pull out that um, key and try and reassign adios um, as the new value for that. And when you print, um, oh, Yes, so we can't change hello, but we can change the value of audios. So printing out the dictionary again, we've we can't change hello, but we can change the value associated, which is now audios. Okay. So um hopefully that's all making sense. Um we're gonna go into a couple other data types. Um so we've looked at numbers, character strings. Um you can also do logical values or Boolean values. Um, so this is true false values. And again, this is case sensitive. So um, Python is just a capital for each of those and then lowercase. Um, so if you type, oh, whoops. Um, if you type all uppercase true or false, that won't work. It won't register as a logical value. Um, yeah, and uh, it also won't read them as characters because there's not uh, quotations around them. Um, yeah, so it has to be exactly this true or false here. Uh, and so we can try making a um, a list of true false true false values. Um, 
called logic and then we can check the type of that and um, it is a list and it we can print out that entire list uh, but you'll notice using that type function it doesn't tell us what you know, it doesn't tell us that it's a logical list. Uh, so in order to do that, we have to pull out specific elements to check. Um, and so if you know your um, list is all of the same type, you can just pull out one element. So um, logic, and then we're gonna pull out the first element, element zero, and check the type of that. And that's where it shows us that it's Boolean. Um, but the other thing is with, um, if you use a NumPy array, they'll all be the same type and you can just check one element. If you use a list like this, um, there's a possibility they could be different types. Each element is a different type. Um, so we can check all of the elements in there. Um, and here we just have like a little for loop that checks each one. Um, so you could just use this um, type and then pull out element zero, one, two, three. Um, so that's what this for loop is doing. Um, it's just a little bit shorter in this case. And then, so we'll run that. So if we created um, a list that has false space in quotes and the number two, we can see that the data types are Boolean, string, and integer. So, um, and then another uh, interesting data type in Python is similar to a lot of these. It's called a tuple. Um, it's a lot like a vector. Um, it's ordered, so it's indexed by um, the position of each element. Um, but the, the thing about this is it's, I keep doing that. Uh, it's immutable. You can't change anything about it. <laughs> Once you create it, that's how it stays. Um, so it's sort of making sure once data gets in there, you can't accidentally change anything. And to do that, instead of square brackets, you use the rounded parentheses. So here's an example. Okay, so created this tuple X example, um, some different elements in there. Um, so uh, this next chunk of code, we're saying let's assign this value of four to the first element in tuple X. Uh, what do you think will happen? <laughs> I try to run this. Out. We get an error. <laughs> so in usually errors are somewhat descriptive, which helps. So tuple does not support item assignment. So we created it. We can't change any of the values in it. Um, so that's something you might encounter. Mm. There's not a fourth value. No. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So. Four doesn't mean anything. We're saying we have this object called tuple X. Um, it has it has elements zero, one, two in it, and we're trying to say what this first element, element zero in tuple X, we want to give a value of four. But we already have this tuple created, and it already has a value for that zeroth element. So we can't assign something new to it. Um, we can't change it at all. So. Unlike the other types, the other. Dictionaries of this. Right. Yes. So you can only do that for dictionaries? Dictionaries and lists. Um, you can pretty much reassign any values of the other data types. You cannot reassign key names in dictionaries, and you can't reassign anything in tuples. What's the benefit of using a tuple over a list or a dictionary? <laughs> I had to Google that. I'm like, why would you ever use this? Uh, it's basically just like, for data you know won't change and you just want it to be in there and prevent any changes from being made it's sort of like a read only mode mm -hmm. um or you know if you're sharing data with uh, or an analysis with collaborators like you just want that to stay the same all the time so. thanks <laughs> um okay so we have all these different um data types um numbers characters logical um, and we have different types of vectors lists that we can use. Um, so for this part, um, exercise three, we're sort of looking at um, how we can mix those things together in the same uh, object. So um, what happens if we create um, okay, num car um, is an object and we are giving it values of one, two, three and the letter A. 
um, if we run that, and then this next line is looking at um, what are each of the going back to that for loop where we check each of the element data types. I'll just run all of this. So we create uh, this object and check the data types and it shows us that it's integer, 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 and string, uh, which makes sense. Um, and then we're also doing that with num logic. We can mix uh, numbers with logical values. So one, two, three, and false in our types are integer, 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 Boolean, um, and then we have two other examples in here, which I'll copy um, this for loop. So we can create um, uh, car logic, um, the letters A, B, C, and then true. And then this is car logic. We want to loop through that object and tell us the type for each of those elements. We'll rerun that. So that is um, string, 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 boolean. And then the last little example. Um, we have something for you guys to guess. Um, uh, and it's one, the numbers one, two, three, and uh, the text four. Um, so we'll run that. Um, so integer, integer, integer string. Um, so kind of setting that up that you, with this square bracket, making a list, you can mix data types. Uh, and then there's certain formats where I mentioned you can't mix data types. So if you use a NumPy array, which is also a type of vector that we went over, I'll show you what happens if you use something where you can't mix data types. Um, put that here. And here. Okay, so I'm going to run this again. And now we can see that when we mix these data types, something happens uh, called coercion. And so there's sort of like a dominant data type that it'll coerce or change one of the values to. So it makes all of the values match into the same data type. So in this first case, um, there was this one character string and it coerced all the numbers into also being char uh, character strings. So that's where we can see all these elements here are now NumPy string, character string. Um, and then here we have numbers and a logical value. Um, the output is here. Um, so now they all become numbers. So true false gets coerced into a number where um, true is a one and false is a zero. Um, and then we have character strings and a true. Those get also coerced into all um, character strings. So true then becomes true in quotes the word true, right? Yeah. And then this guess object, lastly, um, again, every, the numbers get turned into character strings. So that's these last four here. Um, so it kind of shows that there's this hierarchy of when you um, mix um, data types within an object that only allows one, um, uh, It'll mostly coerce everything to a character string. That's sort of like the safest option, more dominant type that it goes to. Um, next, it might coerce it to numbers. So like here, false became a zero. Um, and then you only have all logical if, um, or it's only coerced to logical uh, data type for all of them if they're all true false. So that's like the bottom of the hierarchy. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> sort of a lot there. Um, yeah, so if you use NumPy array, you just have to be careful of that. Most of the other data types allow different types of data or data types. So uh, you can have a mixture. Um, and here, as Sarah had asked, uh, this is sort of like comparing R and Python. Some of the ter terminology overlaps and R list is like a dictionary 
and an R vector is like a Python list. Um, and then we can have lists of lists. So, um, little example here, we're going to create three lists, OS, save nums, and logic, and there are different data types, so characters, numbers, and logical. Um, and then we're going to use those to create a list out of those lists. And you do the same thing where you use the square brackets to start making a list. And now you put the object names for each of the elements. Okay. Um, and when we pull out something from this list of lists, if we pull out the, I'm not going to say first, because it, it's the zero, one, tooth, second. Um, so one here is pulling out um, zero, one is pulling out fave nums. Um, so pulling that out, it shows us the entire object that was listed in that position. So um, this fave nums object um, list. Um, and then we can go beyond that and pull out something specifically um, within a list of a list. So we use uh, this double bracket notation. So layered list, we're going to use the zeroth element, which is OS. And then out of that, we're going to pull the first element, which is Windows. Um, and so you can see the output here is Windows. And then this next line is just using the print, um, the print uh, function to reproduce that. Um, and then in the notes here, it's just a note about using print versus using just the object name. So there's, you can do either way here again um, in Jupyter Notebook, but if you're using some different environments, you'll have to use print to get any of the output. Okay. Uh, and then you can also uh, name your list. Um, um, by creating a dictionary. So here we're going to create um, a dictionary with a key title, numbers, and data. And now for that dictionary, and before we were just assigning like a single word for each of the values, but you can assign a character. You can assign um, an entire list as that value for numbers. Um, yeah. So you can assign whatever you want as a value in a dictionary. Um, and then it gives that a name. So you can see here the result of that. Title is statistics, numbers is this entire list. Data is true. Okay. Um, and then, so we're gonna move on to like, um, probably the most used um, data format, which is data frames. Um, a lot of times you'll collect data in a spreadsheet and that's what you want to pull into Python and do analysis on. Um, so we can do that with the pandas module. Um, and then uh, as part of the workshop, you should have this Blackfoot fish CSV. So that's a spreadsheet data. Um, and we can use uh, import the pandas module and call it PD. So we can use that. And we're going to use the function out of that um, called read CSV and we run that. And this reads um, this spreadsheet. So now it's available in Python uh, and we haven't showed shown any of the output. So it's just in Python's memory environment. Um, so we can take a look at that now that it's imported. Um, if you have trouble, um, you know, if it's in the same folder, you can just give it the name. Otherwise, you might have to get it, give it a path. Um, and there's sort of an example down here. You can pull it off of the R repository online if you need to. Um, so now we have Blackfoot fish is an object. It's a data frame we imported, and we can take a look at that to find out more information about the data frame. Um, so um, we can use functions to do that, and these are a part of like the base Python, you don't need any extra packages for this part of it. Um, so um, we have our data set name and then dot shape gives you the number of rows and columns. So here it's um, 
18,352 rows and seven columns. Um, uh, using the columns function in the same way it gives you the column names. Um, so trip, mark, length, weight, etc. Those are the column names in the data set. And then D types um, gives you a little more information. So it lists the column name and also what type of data is stored in there. So trip is a integer numeric um, value for all of the entries under trip. Mark is also um, integer length float is, I think, decimal valued uh, numeric. Um, and then down here, section species, these are listed as object, which um, we'll see our characters, but it sort of lists as, as object where um, it's sort of like a more unspecified type of, um, I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> it, it's like it kind of undefined, like it could be turned into anything, but right now everything stores characters. Um, and we can take a look here. Um, so, um, yeah, so here we check the type of the um, type and then the data set name, and it tells us it's a pandas data frame. Um, so I'm going to replace this. This is the same thing. I'm going to use info. I guess I don't need to copy it. Um, so these two functions will kind of show us some more information about the data set Blackfoot Fish. And that. Okay, so using describe, it gives us this uh, glimpse of what the data set looks like. So um, it's summarizing the data set uh, with summary statistics. So for each of the variables, so um, for trip, mark, length, it gives us the count, mean, standard deviation, min, max, and the different quartiles. Um, so you can get an idea of what's in there. Um, and these are only for the numeric variables that we have. Um, and then running info, also gives us the different, um, it tells us how many rows there are or entries. Remember they start at zero, <laughs> um, there's seven columns and these are the column names. Um, and it lists how many are non-null, so how many are not missing values. So all of these look like there's a value for every row except for weight. There's only 16,500 some non-null values. So that means there's a good number that there's missing values under that um, column. Um, and then the data type again. Um, so we just have a summary here of different options you can use to get a uh, inspect your data set um, once it's imported. So um, yeah, shape, um, you can pull out the number of rows from shape or number of columns from shape. Um, uh, an, Other option you can use is um, you take your data set name, so black, blackfoot fish, and then you can pull out a certain column. Um, like if we did trip here, and then you use this function called len for length. Um, and there's a typo in here. It tells you the number of rows. So you're pulling out just one column and then checking the length of that column. So there should be that 18,352 for that. So it's number of rows, not columns. Um, you're pulling out one column. <laughs> um, you can also use head and tail to check the first five rows or first or last five rows. Um, you can use column names to get the column names, index to get row names. And then we took a look at info and describe to get some summary statistics. Um, and structure of the object. Um, so just to summarize here, data frames are a type of object where it's a table-like structure with rows and columns. Columns um, have to have the same data type within each column, but each column can be a different data type. Um, yeah, uh, so you often see like CSVs, Excel files, SQL databases, stuff like that. Uh, you can also create your own data frame from scratch in Python by creating a list or a dictionary. So, um, okay. Right on. Um, do we need a quick break or is everybody good? I think we can Let's just like get up for okay. two minutes. All right, you <laughs> Shake your legs for two minutes.
Yeah, just breathe. I don't think I could ever use a standing desk. Or just I agree, it's a different like mind space. Yeah. Versus <laughs> All right. It looks like Sarah is ready to go. <laughs> Y'all feeling okay? <laughs> I, I know that sometimes that um, people have to leave early, and so um, if we don't need a break, we can keep going. Um, and <clears throat> that way, if you do have to leave before five, you can do that. Um, okay, so now we've got our Blackfoot fish data in. We want to be able to get data out of that so that we can answer particular questions. Um, and so we're going to talk about getting um, particular variables out. We're going to dig a little bit more into this idea of zero based. Um, and this is just really important to, to make sure that you keep in mind that you know which is which. If you're if you only speak one language, if you only code in Python, you get used to it and it's just your normal. If you go back and forth between multiple languages, if you go back and forth between R and Python, you really just have to kind of keep them separate and know their their um, differences and their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, and so since this is a data science series of workshops and we um, do most of our workshops in R and we do this one in Python and hopefully we'll add on more Python workshops. Um, we want to make sure that we're capturing the differences um, between both of the languages and bringing those out when important. Um, all right. So again, um, let's um, we're going to reread the Blackfoot Fish data set. Um, this time we're going to give it a shorter name just to save a little bit of typing. Um, although this is already already typed, so that we don't have to type it ourselves, um, but just know now that df is going to be our data frame our blackfoot fish data frame and we can access out just the weight column by putting weight in quotes you can either do double quotes or single quotes it doesn't matter as long as it's the same type on both sides um, in a square bracket for the data frame we're going to call that weight underscore call just so that we know that it's coming out of something and then um we're going to do something kind of dangerous. We're going to print it and see what happens here. Oh, thank goodness. It didn't print out all 18,000 rows. Python is a little bit smarter than um, it used to be. So um, uh, sometimes you have to be careful about what you do, right? Um, it could have potentially printed out everything in that column. But like I said, they put in a lot of safeguards in Python 3 that it didn't used to exist. And so it's only giving you the head and the tail. In giving you a little bit more information, it's the um, gives you the name of the column, and the link, and then the float sixty four. Uh, if you imported this data in a different way, where it's not a pandas data frame and it's it's a different type of data frame, it might not have those safeguards on there. So just be really careful. Um, use the head and tail as much as you can, unless you know for sure that it's not going to print out everything. All right, so. Um, if we did something similar, and um, here we're actually going back to oh, this is so this is our third time teaching this workshop, um, and so we still have a few typos in there. We probably should call that just DF. So I'm just going to take a note here since we have already redone that, and we're going to extract out here. So I'm going to go ahead and add a call at the end just to be consistent with wait. And now I want years underscore call that just the head. And um, we can look at the structure of years underscore call. And then we can print that structure and we can get the length of year underscore calls. And we're going to store that in N and then we're going to print N. And now we're going to run all of these all at once. If you're on a command line, these would, would run one at a time. Okay. So now again, the head just gives you the first five um, entries in that column. So they're all 1989. Um, if we look at the structure STR of that column, it's similar to just printing the column itself. 
it gives you um, the head and the tail. So we can see the head is all 1989, the tail is all 1991. These are not stored in the data frame in consecutive order. Um, we'll, when we visualize the data, we'll see all of the years that are encompassed with that. Uh, and then the end gives us the length of that column. So we um, see 18,352. Um, that, if there were any missing variables in there, that's not going to change the length. That length is always going to be the same. So if we want to access, so another way to access data out of a data frame is using indexes or indices to um, get into specific locations in that data frame. And um, so we're going to use a function called iloc or iloc um, for indexed location. And we can roughly think of a data set as a matrix of entries where, again, it's, it's roughly because Matrices are generally all of the same data type, but um, our columns and our matrix can be different data types, but we can think of that um, two dimensional um, structure of how we can find the appropriate row and column. And um, so I'm going to go back to calling this just DF for data frame and I lock. Um, and instead of giving it the years column name, I want to say I want in um, this I location index location uh, square brackets uh, for matrix notation. The colon means I want all rows, comma, and then the four means I just want the fourth column. And the dot values means just give me the values of that and we're saving that and we'll just call this years um, since we're accessing that a different way and then we can look at the structure of that. And now we can see that this is uh, a vector. And because it has the still has the square brackets around it and um, we only see the first 3 values and the last 3 values, uh, but they are consistent with how we accessed it before. So let's create um, another data frame. Um, let's actually, well, let's just leave it the name there. Um, and this is going to be much smaller so that if you wanted to draw it out on a piece of paper, you could, um, or we can just look at it this way. Um, it's gonna have three um, named columns, X, Y, and Z. X um, has H, N, T, W, and V in there. Uh, y has some month names. Um, in no particular order. Uh, and then Z has, looks like maybe some years in there, uh, again, in no particular order. And um, then we're gonna just print that out. Because it is small um, and not like the Blackfoot fish data frame, uh, we, when we print it out, we get the whole thing. So we can see it as a matrix and it gives us the column names that, um, that we provided X, Y, and Z, and it also gives it some row names zero through four. So before you run the next few code chunks, just think about what the answer would be. So if we um, use this data frame and then used iloc and um, did square brackets two comma colon, what would we get out of that? Uh, yeah, the third row. <laughs> so if we count normally, it would be three down. So it should be T, Mar, and 2018. Let's see if that's true. And that is true. Okay. Um, or we can think of this as the row that has index two or the named row two. Uh, how could we get an output of 2015? Um, there's many ways to do this, uh, not infinite ways, but there are at least more than two. Um, so we have three possible ways here. Let's just confirm that all of that will work. So um, row named one or row indexed with one, column two. So that's actually this one. And that um, column two is actually the Z because it's the third column and that would be 2015. In the data frame, we look at the column Y. 
and look to where that is equal to October. And then we get out the value from the Z column. This is a kind of a complicated way to answer that question, but that would work. Um, and then the last one would be in the row named one or indexed with one in the Z column. So all of those should be 2015. Um, for the second comma, mm -hmm. you can also use like X then mm -hmm. if you're using Y. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we could change this. Let's add one more. And the reason why that this is in here is when I'm doing data science, sometimes I will know some information. I want to pull out all of the site visits from a particular location. So I know that in my data frame, I've got my site visit column and I want all the rows where site visit is Bozeman. And then from that, I want all of the heights, right? And so that's a reason why you would use something that's kind of complicated like that. Um, so if we have named locations, we can use names instead of index locations. So uh, a named location is the same function, just doesn't have an I. Um, and then I location means you're using numbers instead of names, so it won't be in quotes. Um, iloc is exclusive of the n index location is inclusive um iloc does not support boolean indexing but location does it's all kind of complicated but really what i want to get into is um talking a little bit more about what zero index means uh, because when we want to extract more than just one thing it can be a little bit tricky so if we wanted to um, get a specific element if we want the third element, if it's zero based, that means we tell it that we want element two. Right? So grades two um, would give us 93, even though it's the third in the list. Um, when we slice, it gets a little bit more complicated. If we want the two middle elements, because it's zero based, we have to shift our indices, but we have to actually make our range a little bit bigger to make sure that we're getting two elements instead of just one. So um, if we want the second and the third element, we shift the two to a one, but we have to actually keep the um, second number at a three. So it looks like we've got three numbers there, but it's really only two because it's on either side of the second and third elements. Any questions about that? Let's test that out. Um, so we can, I'm actually going to do this a little bit. Okay, let's list out numbers one through five. So we get one through five. I'm gonna put that back in there and I'm gonna cut this out again. Now I'm going to, to that, I'm going to add, um, I'm going to get a range of values from one to six, and let's see what happens when we go one to six. We actually go one to five um, because um, it is, six is just a little bit past that. And so we uh, are getting six, um, it counts, after the, uh, it stops after the five. Um, okay, paste that back in there again. Now let's see what happens. If we go range starting at six, going to one, and the third parameter here, negative one means we should be going back by one. Okay, so we start at six. So range actually starts where it says it's going to start, and then it doesn't get all the way to one, um, because we are, um, the one would be the next one, but we don't quite get there. Okay? And we're, we're counting down by one. Um, and then we can look at some of the similar ones here. Um, so we can have bigger numbers starting at 123. We don't, we get to one less than 131 in that list. 
um, and we can count backwards from three to negative one, but we actually mean that we stop at zero. Um, and then we can extract, and then using that information, we can extract things out. So in the list from one to five, and that was actually the numbers one to five, if we want to extract out elements one through three, that's actually, when we li list it out, it should be two and three, and we get two and three. Uh, in the range from 123 to 131, the indexes, indices three to six, zero, one, two, three, three to six, three, four, five, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, should be 126 to 128. And then we can do the same thing. We can have a list that goes backwards and extract out elements two to four. So um, zero, one, two, three, four. So it's like you're counting the, the spaces in between the numbers and we get four and three. We can use adjacent, uh, we can, extract adjacent items using the colon notation. So that um, gives us everything from positions three up to up and two, but not including six. Um, if we want non-adjacent items, we have to list them all out. And so if we want the first, third, and ninth in the zero-based list, then we would have to use square brackets one comma three comma nine. And um, so if we wanted to extract rows one and two, we could use one comma two or one to three, and we should get the same information. So both of these should be the same and they are. Um, but if we want rows one and three, we have to just use square brackets one comma three. Since they're not adjacent. And you could do the same thing um, if the rows or columns are named, um, is it, remember it, you just take the I off of the loc function and um, you can also do the same thing with columns. And so um, I did not clear out all the exercises so we could just run this, but let's talk it through. So if we want only columns X and Y, we can use I lock and get z or use zero and one. X and Z would be zero and two, but if we want to use their names, we can use loc. So we actually um, don't have pulling off X and Y with their names. So we can type that in df.loc square bracket colon for all rows, comma, square bracket, because we're going into the list of columns, X, comma, Y. And then we can run all of those and we should get um, pairs of results that match. So this one should match that one and it does. And this one, the second and fourth should match and they do. All right, so let's just test this really quick. Um, if we wanted out, well, let me put that back in there. Let's change this. Let's say um, 49 and 18. How would we change this code here to get an output of 49 and 18? Two to four, zero, one, two, three. Yes. Let's try it. Two to four. Yes. Very good. Um, all right. What would be output if you entered S two comma? So what's missing here? Uh, 
Uh, let's just see what happens. List indices must be integers or slices, not tuple. Um, it's not exactly a very informative um, error message for somebody that might be new to Python. Um, S is, let's look at the type of S. S is a list. When we do square brackets to comma, what are we setting up? Don't put anything here. Rows and columns. Rows and columns, yeah. So this would be almost like saying, give me the second row and all the columns, even though we don't have a colon in there, um, or it looks like it's an incomplete statement. Um, so if we want just the second entry, we want we just want to have two. And now it's happy. Okay. So you have to really keep in mind um, what type of data you're working with. Are you working with a list? Are you working with the data? data frame? Are you working with the matrix? How many dimensions does it have? Um, it doesn't matter what language you're dealing with. All of them are very particular about making sure that you access data in the uh, appropriate way. Okay. Um, let's go back and um, so we've already done this again. Uh, we've are, or so we've already imported this. We're going to add to importing um, Blackfoot fish this time we're going to add one more parameter, uh, D type. And so that means um, data type. And um, we're going to say that we want the data type of a column. Um, uh, let's see here. We're going to specify the data type for each column. So let's see what happens when we do this. Do we need to? Um, Not describe info. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are getting the data frame, uh, the data type of these objects. If we wanted to, we could um, say uh, overwrite um, a data type. So let's say um, we could, uh, if we know that we have a very sparse data type. So if we know that we collected, um, uh, weights for a, a very small fraction of all of the 18,000 fish, um, to, it is auto detecting the types of these data based on a very, not by looking at all of the data in the column, but only the first thousand or so um, observations. And so if the first thousand or so observations are all missing, it might not actually know the type of data that it should be. And so you can deliberately tell it what type of data um, that it should be. Uh, there are, if you do use R, there's another type data type called a factor variable. Um, by default, pandas um, doesn't um, think about factors, and so it doesn't use that. Um, so it's not necessarily something we have to worry about in Python, but the main reason that you would want to overwrite the default type is if you have, again, sparse data. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about these two um, ones that can't be summarized, section and species. So this is um, some data that was collected many years ago on uh, from the fish from the Blackfoot River. And um, there were two sections of fish. I think there's, well, let's look. What are the values here? Um, there are four species of fish, RBT, WCT, bull and brown. If you've been to our intro to our workshop, you'll know that those are four, uh, four trout species. 
Um, and we can see the first few measurement or a few observations. We've got some rainbow trouts and some brown trouts. And um, the unique function gives us um, all of the unique values. Notice that there's a difference between unique with parentheses and unique without parentheses. Um, unique with parentheses is probably what you're thinking about when you want to find unique values uh, because it's treating it like a function. It's giving you an array of the four um, possible values. If you just tell you say unique, it just gives you a head and tail summary of the column. That's not exactly what you want. Um, all right, so let's change this to section and see what the sections are. So there's two sections of river that were um, surveyed. Um, and uh, so there's two possible values for that um, character color. Year is a type of data that could either be um, discrete or could be considered quantitatively and discrete values could be considered um, categorical or factor variables. Uh, and um, so we can take a number variable and turn it into a categorical variable. We're going to use um, the categorical um, function from the pandas module or categorical attribute from the pandas module. And um, black, we're going back to the version where it's Blackfoot fish written out so that it's a little bit more informative, looking at the year variable. And we're going to, because um, data frames are not tuples, and even if it was a dictionary, which a data frame kind of is a dictionary, uh, we can add new entries into the dictionary. We just can't change the keys. So we are adding a new uh, um, entry into the um, Blackfoot fish data frame. We're going to call it year F because we're modifying the year variable that's numeric and we're turning it into a categorical variable. So again, we can't really see anything there, but we have a number here so we know that it did run. And so let's look at the unique values of year F and the unique values of just year. Um, we basically have the same information, um, number uh, years from 1989 to 2006. Not all the years are in there. Um, we did do some sampling to reduce the size of the data frame. Um, and in the first option, we uh, it is recognized as categorical with 10 possible categories um, stored as integers. And those names, integer names, are 1989 to 2006. Otherwise, originally, it's just an array, an umpire array, or a pandas array um, of integer type and uh, 1989 to 2006. It does order them, so unique does order them uh, in numerical order. All right, we're working towards being able to visualize things, so we need to be able to add more packages because um, visualizing things uses a lot of packages. Um, another really common package um, that's used in Python is SciPy um, to do um, scientific functions, um, some stats. And so from SciPy, so from the SciPy module, we're going to import the stats part portion of that, and we're just going to import it as stats. Now, if you're not giving it a name, an alias, if you're just keeping the name exactly as it is, you don't technically need this as stats part. Having that, though, helps make it more readable so that you know that where it refers to stats, it actually means the stats package from the SciPy package. Uh, we're also going to use NumPy, which is another common package, and this one is getting an alias. We're going to call that MP. This is very common, um, uh, a very common alias. 
we're going to generate two random numbers from a normal distribution. So normal distributions need a um, uh, center and scale. Scale look um, no scale and location is the same thing. Um, they need a mean and a standard deviation. So we're going to give it um, standard normal always has a mean of zero, always has a standard deviation of one. Um, and so we're going to have our random numbers be called samples. So from the stats part of the SciPy module, um, we're going to access the normal, the norm attribute. And from norm, we're going to do RVS for random values. Um, so you can think of other distributions. If you want random values from other distributions, you probably just change where it says norm. And that would be true. Uh, and then we need location and scale. So here we go. So LOC for location, that would be our center. So that's mu. Scale is our variability. So that's sigma. Um, and if you really, you know, we're getting into the stats, this is not a stats class, but you'd really want to make sure um, is if you're not doing standard normal, is this looking for standard deviation or if it's looking for variance? Um, but when it's a standard normal, it doesn't matter. Square root of one is one. And size equals a thousand. What should that do? Thousand values. A thousand random values. Good. Um, and then from that, from samples, we're going to, um, and from N, uh, NumPy, we're going to use the mean function. We're going to calculate the mean of all those random values, which should be close to zero if we did this right. Um, and standard deviation is STD. Um, of those sample, samples, that should be close to one. And then we're going to have mean, comma, standard deviation. Um, so that just print out those values. Then we can also use a printf function to combine text with uh, variables. And we can turn those numbers into a string where we say the mean is whatever the mean is. Notice that's in curly braces and the standard deviation is whatever the standard deviation is. So let's run that. All right. So um, probably would want to round this, but we'll worry about that later. It, um, if I round it myself, it would be negative 0 0.011. So that's fairly close to one. And 1 1.003, which is pretty close to one. And so out of our 1,000 random samples, we did have um, um, the values do seem like they are coming from a standard normal distribution. Again, that's a little bit stats heavy, but just kind of give you an idea of how you can access stats functions um, using Python. Okay. I do want to caution you. If you're using Python for data wrangling, data manipulation, basically the same thing, um, uh, programming to do complicated things for different inter interfaces for different programs, accessing SQLite databases. Python is great for that. Python for doing statistics, um, linear models, data visualization. Um, it is trickier, more cumbersome. There are pluses and minuses. Python, again, is a little bit more um, cautious in making sure that you don't do some things that you shouldn't do. Uh, it just takes a lot more coding, a lot lengthier statements to get something like a linear model or a regression line in Python compared to R. Okay. You can do both. You can do your data cleaning in Python and then switch over to R and do your analysis in R. Um, so there are, there's a good reason to be able to speak multiple languages. Uh, for finding help, you can use um, some package or module help, um, but uh, with the built-in help function, um, so if we wanted to like import the entire SciPy package and get help on the entire SciPy module, we could do that and it'll put um, some documentation down there and it'll give you some um, sub packages 
and ways to get access into those. And that would be, you know, good. Um, it's better, quicker, faster to just either go to Stack Overflows, Python community, or um, put into your favorite search engine, Python, and then whatever you're trying to do. Uh, if you use generative AI um, to do your Python coding, um, you need to be able to read it to make sure that it's doing the right thing and then check the output, but that would be another way to do it. Um, Sally is more versed in using AI to get code out. Um, I've been avoiding it. So it makes mistakes. <laughs> yeah, it makes mistakes. So you have to be able to read it. You have to really distrust everything. Um, all right. Before we move on to um, more talking about functions, a little bit more detail, are there any questions? Um, so we're going to just talk about a couple of other functions that might be useful for being able to read them. Um, let's say that we want to create a vector of 10 zeros. And uh, we want to make sure that um, we do the right thing uh, and they're all the same type. So we're going to use a NumPy array because that gives us that security that we're not going to accidentally slip in as an O instead of a zero. Right. Um, and so what we're going to do is this is actually really nice and intuitive. Uh, we put zero in square brackets because that's what we want. And then we have the multiplication symbol times 10. So zero, 10 times. And um, because multiplication doesn't matter what order you do it in, uh, it shouldn't matter what order you do it in here. And let's actually let's run that. The difference between um, these two is that one is the NumPy array again, which ensures that we don't have some some O's slip in with our zeros, um, where we can't tell them apart. Um, uh, other other than that, it's all the same. So we see that we have two uh, or four um, vectors of ten zeros, two of which are in NumPy arrays. Uh, we briefly used uh, or previously used uh, NP mean before. Let's dig into that a little bit and see where we might potentially have some issues. Um, so I'm going to, again, I'm going to just look at this one at a time. So I'm going to cut out all of it, um, all the code except for the first one. So NumPy array uh, or NumPy mean of Blackfoot fish, uh, the weight column. See what happens here. Okay, get a number out, 246. And um, if we remember, um, the weight column was one that actually had some missing values in it. Let's go back to uh, add in blackfootfish.info. Weight has only 16,500 non-null values. Um, so maybe we're not really sure how it's handling those non-missing values and we don't necessarily trust that it's doing the right thing. So we want to um, look at and tell it explicitly that we want to um, drop out all of the uh, missing values so that our denominator is just the 16,556 and not all of, of the um, possible rows. And if we do that, we notice we get exactly the same value. So by default, Python is just completely ignoring any missing values. Again, to compare with R, R would throw an error and would just give you missing if there were any missing, if there was at least one missing value in your column without you explicitly telling it to ignore the missing values. Let's see what happens if we try to do np.median of blackfoot fish species. 
just, maybe just comment the next one out. All right, we get a huge red box. <laughs> Um, compute the median along the specified axis. To scroll all the way to the bottom. Type error. U func divide not supported for the input types, and the inputs could not be safely coerced to any supported types according to the casting rule. Safe. All right. We were trying to compute a median of what type of variable? Sorry. It's not a number. That I it's not a number, right? Species was the different, the four different types of, of trout species. Um, so maybe we're thinking more about the mode um, or most common, right? Um, so you have to make sure that um, you're actually giving it something that it can compute a median of. Another thing is uh, if we want to look at the correlation between two um, values. Length and width correlation is the strength of the quantit or quantitative or linear relationship between two quantitative value variables. Okay, so am I tricking you again? Length and weight, are they both quantitative? Yes. Okay, so this should work, but it doesn't. We get a one, uh, so length is perfectly correlated with itself, and then the rest of them are NANDs. Um, what the problem here is that weight has fewer observations in it than length, and it just doesn't know how to handle the cases where weight is missing and length isn't missing. So weight, uh, in R, there um, is a way to give the correlation function a way to handle those missings, but in Python, it makes you actually deal with the missingness first before you can actually then come back and compute that correlation co coefficient. So how can we deal with the missingness? Um, one way is to just completely remove the missing values and then compute the correlation coefficient. So um, this is kind of a complicated way of doing it, but we can look for all of the in all of the row numbers where um, either length is missing, um, so, sorry, it's a valid mask. So we want all the row indices where both have a number. So this tilde means not. Uh, so we're looking for values that are NANs, but then that's a not. So where values are not NANs in length and the ampersand means and, all of the values that are not missing in the weight column. So we're looking for where we have to have a valid number in both length and weight. No missing in either. Then, um, since that's a mask, it's a, a vector of indices that are good. We want to keep those. We can use that um, as a secondary index in the length their uh, vector to pull those row indices out. We're going to call it length valid and do the same thing using the same row indices for the weight column. And now we should be able to calculate a correlation coefficient. I'm going to get the full table here first. And um, I'm going to comment out this print statement first. Takes a little bit to think about. Oh, it didn't print it out. That's why. Let's print out the table. Okay, so everything should be, or both of them should be perfectly correlated with themselves. So we should have one on the diagonal, and we do. And on the off diagonal, it should match, and it does um, 0.886. Um, so now we can extract out, a, um, they're the same, so it doesn't matter which one we do, but we could do um, the first row, so index zero. And the second column, so index one, and we just get out that particular value. And um, let's see. Let's just play around here. <laughs> okay. So np.round will round that really long string to three values. And now we can print that out. I'm going to change where it says 
correlation coefficient in curly braces, I'm going to round that to just three digits. And now we get a string that has that value embedded in it. The correlation coefficient is 0 0.886. And then we um, break that down line by line. So if you're reading this on your own later, then, then you have um, that written down for you. Uh, we only have missing values in the weight column, but if you wanted to uh, clean an entire data frame, get rid of any rows that had at least one missing value in it, um, we can just use the drop in a function, uh, open close parentheses. Um, the shape attribute gives us the dimensions of that. So we can just do the strongest thing possible and remove all um, rows where there's at least one missing value. And that does give us down, get us down to our minimal data frame. And we want to do that because we need to make sure that we don't have any missing values before going into data visualization. Um, there might be better ways of more nuanced ways of um, doing this, um, particularly if you're only if you want to keep some of those values for some of your visualizations and not others, you can do that. But at least for right now, we're just going to drop down to the 16,500 or so um, observations for our visualization. Um, and so that we don't have to have this drop in a um, function for every time we want to plot something, we're going to save this as Blackfoot fish clean. Let's run that. And I will pass it over to Sarah. So again, we don't see anything, but we do have a number there because it did run. I'm gonna swoop in and do the fun stuff. <laughs> Hopefully I can do this. I'm also new to Python, um, but let's get started with some data visualization. So we have this clean, data set that's going to be good for visualization. And we're going to make scatter plots, distributions. I think we're going to make box plots and bar charts. So these are some of the more common ways to visualize data. And before we do that, up until this point in the tutorial, we've been wanting to see every step of the code that we're um, that we're writing, we're wanting to see the results of every step, but at this point, we only want to see the output of the chart. So we're going to change this code from above um, from the Python core interactive shell. We're going to import it and then we're going to say last or the node interactivity equals last. So that means it's just going to show you print out the last um, command that you write. So let's run that. Oops. And then let's start with some scatter plots. So a scatter plot shows the relationship between two variables across several or many cases. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I've done something wrong already. <laughs> um, so let's make a scatter plot here, the plot dot scatter using our Blackfoot fish clean data weight and length. So we wanna show a scatter plot of length and weight. It might take a minute on my computer. It was, you'll see a little um, like hourglass up here if it's still working, but here's the, um, here's the scatter plot. So this is fine, but as you see, you don't really know what the numbers are. It's a little hard to read. So something that's important when you're doing data visualization is making sure you have labels. So below we have a few more examples of how to add labels. We can set the X label saying that the weight is in grams. Okay, helpful to know. Um, you can set the Y label saying the length is in centimeters, and then you can add a title for your plot length of, by weight of fish and run that. There we are, that makes more sense. So now you can see most of the fish are clustered here in this um, length between you know 200 and 400 and weight between zero and a thousand grams. Um, breaking it down here, the AX, so in this code above, we've said AX dot set the X label. Um, AX means axes, which is part of this matplotlib, which is um, 
the library that we're using. So that represents the axes of the plot. And then, so when you say ax tick params, you're setting the parameters for what the number of ticks. So like these little guys for either or both axes. Um, y we, says we want to set the parameter for the y axis only, and then we do label rotation 90 to rotate the tick labels. So here we have it here. Looks like we haven't rotated the tick labels. Let's try that. I don't know if this is going to work. Whoops. Label rotation. Let's try. Huh. Excuse me. Um, so in. Oh, let's try. No, so go up to um, two lines above that. This one? Yeah. This oh, one. I see. Yes. Thanks. So here we go. Those are the, sorry, those are within the parameters for the ticks. We're saying Y is just normal. We are saying for Y, we want to rotate the, the label. So there you go. We can, you can see we've now rotated the Y axis to 45 degrees. Sarah, can you X out of the. Oh, yes. Thank you. All right. Then next, we, is that clear, everybody? Is okay. Only like things to how your label stuff in your book. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's just um, visual. Okay. Yeah. So next, we'll make a distribution, a histogram that shows how many observations fall into a given range of values, and it can be used to visualize the distribution of a um, one quantitative variable. So matplotlib will use. The current figure and axes to plot any new data, unless you specifically create something new. So we have our. So this is using the what we used in the scatter plot. Is that right? By saying fig. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's like a shortcut. And now we're saying axes for the histogram of black fish clean, and we're charting the length. Now we're showing the plot. Again, it's like just the bare minimum. So if you want to add additional notation, you can use these similar set the Y label, set the X label, etc. And let's try just for fun the tick parameters. Let's see if this will work. I'm sorry. So the first line of all these code checks starts out by defining a subplot that so that it's not reusing. Otherwise, it's just going to be modifying the axes from before. So that, that sets a new. Like, oh, okay. So by saying fig and then this axi the subplot that's setting a new plot, yeah. what would happen? Can we try what would happen if we don't have that? Yeah. Is it too late? Okay. Okay. Like if you don't reset it with fig, it'll just keep adding on to the previous plot. Ah, uh, I see. Like a reset. Gotcha. So fig is a way to reset to a new plot. Well, but the equals plot dot subplot first. Gotcha. Yeah. I still don't understand, but that's okay. Do you all understand? <laughs> first line, that whole first line reset. But it'll only make changes to the big uh, graph that has already drawn right and it wouldn't draw a new graph for you exactly okay. i see yeah. okay it's always good practice that so you know we can put lines of code right after each other because it'll it'll work on the one that we've already set and it'll keep working on that one even if we show it it'll still keep working on the same plot I until see. we define a new one right so then here is this density plot of fish lengths. You can see, as we saw in the scatter plot, most of the lengths are between two and 400 centimeters. Okay. There's no, um, the, um, if you put that before changing the label to density, try try it up there. Mm -hmm. 
I guess what you're seeing here is there's lots of trial and error <laughs> and it doesn't always work. You can go to your help documentation if you're trying to make these specific changes. Um, let's try one last histogram here, adding some um, different bin numbers. So here it's a little hard to tell what's what. You have these like big fat bins and no differentiation between them. Um, but in this next graph, we are saying, take this histogram of Blackfoot fish clean length and add this edge color of black and add a, bin, a number of bins, which is 20. So above when we didn't specify the number of bins, it just chose for us that here, if we want a little more um, granularity in how we're looking at the um, density of the fish lengths, we can use these modifiers. Questions there? You're trying to rotate the tick mark. Yeah. Instead of just X, you need X this time. Oh, okay, nice. Maybe. Let's try that. Yeah. Ah, it worked. Yay. Okay. So before I had just copy pasted from um, the scatter plot, which is just X is what the what we were calling it, right? And now with the histogram, we were calling it X hist, and that makes the plot. And so we have to change our um, our code here, trying to rotate the labels. Which where did I put it? Oh, here. To say X underscore hist, and the tick parameter is saying rotate the Y axis labels forty five degrees. Mm, feels good. <laughs> okay. Next side by side box plots. Um, this is a way to display. Um, the distribution of quantitative variables across different levels of a categorical variable. So in this case, we're going to use the categorical variable species and the quantitative variable weight. And let's. So we're going to call this weight data and. Use these 2 variables. Um, can you help me with this double equals Greta yes. and the S? You have to below right below the last. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So the double equals X selects the row where the species column matches a unique species, a unique species name of S. Let's try that. Or S. You need to run S to see anything. So S is the um so for S <laughs> okay. sorry, Greta, thank you. Sorry. Here you come up it, in the end. This 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 is like combining a ton of, of code all in one line, which is probably not the best way to do it. So first what we're doing is we're looking at um all of the or we're looking at the species column and then we're taking the unique values of that. Okay. And then for S in all of the, that list of unique columns. So that's saying for RBT, for WCT, for bull, for brown. So we're gonna do this for each of the four species and that's in square brackets. So whenever, so we're getting out um, all of the rows where blackfoot fish equals each of those unique values. And again, there's probably a, a cleaner way of doing this, but this is just one way. Mm -hmm. So um, we're looking at all the rows where species is say RBT. And then um, we're getting from that, we're getting the weight weights of those fish out. So it's just iterating over all four species. Let's see. Um, and it's getting that in um, creating a uh, another data frame that has, um, let's see here. If we just put out, um, it's just a list. So let's look at, um, uh, info parentheses. No, um, I want, um, 
not span um, um, uh, my free uh, starts with an S. Shane. Thank you. <laughs> That's not SP, but SE. That's close, right? I don't know how that was in my brain. <laughs> that still might not work. Nope, because it's list. So the. Um... All right, and we need to put it in front. So we get, um, it's a list of all the weights. Um, it should be a list of lists. So if we get the length of weight data, um, square bracket one. And so we have um, for that particular species, 230 observations. So it's creating a list of lists with those observations that will then be used to create the side by side block spots. Again, there are certain things that are not as um, straightforward in Python as they would be in other languages. Interesting. Yeah, this is come back and take our intro to our workshop. <laughs> Or the next one, data viz in R. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, we have our next um, workshop, which I'll tell you at the end, but is in two weeks and it'll be data viz. Okay, I think, are we losing steam? How is everyone feeling? <laughs> You're okay? All right, um, let's just quickly do some bar charts, which is a very simple chart. Again, we're resetting, we're wanting to look at sections. So we're taking Blackfoot fish clean, the value counts in section and rename. We're creating a, a um, variable called section. Is that the right term for it? A term, table. And then here we're resetting the plot again, and we have section. And tell me what index is for section. So there's two sections. And we've got counts for each section. So the in section index is John Zerd and Scotty Brown. Okay. And then the values of how many are in each section. And then just for fun, we've added a color here. And then probably other colors can work too. Yeah. And then we've added labels like we did above. Let's do our. I can't remember it. The rotate the labels just for fun. There we go. And then showing the plot. And then, so we have exercise 11 and 12 um, are two little exercises for you to work on on your own. I think we could try one of them using stats or graphics, which year, no, let's make the box plot of the fish weights over the different years of the data set. I like this one because actually I figured out a simpler way to do it when I was working on it on my own. So, Let's see, we have using the code for the box plot above, I copy pasted this. Oh, no, I used the same thing. I just copy pasted. So if you copy and add these different, change the parameters. So instead of looking at species weight, we're looking at years. So we're looking for the unique year and the weight and his year and year weight by year. There we are. So now you can see over the course of the years that the fish weights were gathered, how they are, um, how they look. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, let me quickly just show you, oops, just Montana. 
you go to the data science webpage and then to training. So that's montana.edu slash data science slash training. We, this is maybe where you found us, but you can register for future workshops here, which um, links out to the library. And then you can also see workshop recordings from past workshops. So we have um, all of the workshops that we've taught have videos and downloadable materials or tutorials. So this is a good resource resource for you. And you can see if we click here that um, here are our upcoming workshops. We have data viz coming up October 23rd, and that's in R using the ggplot package, and then data wrangling using R on November 6th, 